Palmer. Thanks for joining me as we talk in this video about St. Thomas Aquinas's response to the evil God challenge. Now, I don't know if this challenge existed in the 13th century when St. Thomas Aquinas lived, but I did get a message about a week ago from somebody that goes by King Crimson, and he sent me a message, and he said, hey, will you do a video on the evil God challenge. And so I said, yeah, I, I don't even know what it is, but I'll look it up and I'll do a video on it. So uh, thank you to King Crimson for suggesting this topic. Okay, so I did look it up and here is what the evil God challenge is. It is a philosophical thought experiment. The challenge is to explain why an all good God should be more likely than an all evil God those who advance this challenge assert that unless there is a satisfactory answer to the challenge, there is no reason to accept that God is good or can provide moral guidance. Okay, so most of us have grown up in a very Judeo-Christian, you know, kind of philosophical landscape that says God is good. Okay, but I think this is a legitimate question to ask. Well, why do we assume God is good? Why not say God is evil? And that's what I'm going to explain during the course of this video, using, of course, St. Thomas Aquinas' reasoning. Uh, we go on, the evil God challenge demands explanations for why belief in an all-powerful, all-good God is significantly more reasonable than belief in an all-powerful, all-evil God. Most of the popular arguments for the existence of God give no clue to his moral character and thus appear in isolation to work just as well in support of an evil God as a good God. Okay, so like I said, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, why do we presume that God is good? And that's what I'm going to try to answer in the course of this short video. All right, to start off, I think we have to begin with our experience. Okay, we are sensible beings. We have senses. We have intellect. We have will. I think the average person, when they see a scene like this, is going to be attracted to it. Okay, there's going to be some beauty in this sunrise, in the field that the average person, if not every single person, realizes that this is, this is good, this is something awesome. And then when we see something like this, like a slum, something that looks disordered, we are naturally kind of repulsed by it. Why? Because it lacks goodness, it lacks order. And then, you know, we all have natural desires. I mean, none of us are gonna deny that there are foods that were desired to, you know, most of us like pizza. It's nothing we asked for, but there's goodness in certain things that we are naturally attracted to because we have physiological desires. Um, and also, you know, for for love, for friendship, for romance, for, for sex, you know, we, ha we have this desire for good and we, we see beauty and we see attraction, okay? It's, it's undeniable. So let's start with that premise, first of all. And then going into St. Thomas Aquinas' question about goodness and being, okay? He said, is there really any difference? He said, goodness and being are really the same and differ only in idea, which is clear from the following argument. The essence of goodness consists in this, that it is in some way desirable, like the things I showed in that previous slide, right? So we desire that which is good. Uh, Aristotle says goodness is what all desire. Now it is clear that a thing is desirable only insofar as it is perfect for all desire their own perfection. But everything is perfect insofar as it is actual. Therefore it is clear that a thing is perfect so far as it exists. Okay, this is very interesting, isn't it? For it's, it is existence that makes all thing, things actual. Hence it is clear that goodness and being are the same uh, really, but goodness presents the aspect of desirableness, which being does not present. So not all things that exist are we naturally drawn to, but all things that are good, we are naturally drawn to, okay? So Thomas goes on and says, well, okay, uh, is every being good? Is the spider good? <laughs> is the mosquito good? Uh, how about tornadoes that cause all kinds of horrific damage uh, to our homes or our businesses. Okay, are these things good? Well, Aquinas is going to say, yeah, everything that it, that has being is in some way good, okay, which is a really amazing concept if you think about it. Every being as being is good, okay, for all being as being has actuality as in, and is in some way 
perfect, since every act implies some sort of perfection, and perfection implies desirability and goodness. Hence, it follows that every being as such is good. Believe me, there's a lot of people that love spiders. There's a lot of people that study spiders and mosquitoes, and they're fascinating creatures. Okay, You may not like what they do, but, but they are fascinating creatures. Yeah, they can take away health. They can take away... Uh, you know, they can bite, they can sting, they can cause pain. Um, Thomas goes on, no being can be spoken of as evil formally as being, but only insofar as it lacks being. Thus, a man is said to be evil because he lacks some virtue, and an eye is said to be evil because it lacks the power to see well. So Thomas doesn't really even believe that evil is a thing in itself. Evil is only the absence of the good. All right, so how could God be evil if evil is an absence, that would mean that God doesn't even exist in the first place, right? Uh, so we see in the news evil things like murder. Well, murder is the absence of life. We want, we don't want to see people die. We we like to and treasure life. Um, things like riots are the absence of peace and tranquility. War is the absence of peace, and something like the Holocaust. We recoil from that because we know that there is dignity in life. And when life is taken away sense, senselessly, we, we see that as a privation, right? So th those are bad. Okay, so Thomas goes on and says, does goodness have an aspect of a final cause? Now we're starting to put the pieces together because a final cause implies purpose or meaning. So why, do all, why are we attracted to all these good things? Why are we attracted to pizza and sunrises and sunsets and, and things like that? What's, what's the point? And now we're starting to get to the whole premise here that God has to be good, right? God is the final cause. Uh, God is our purpose. God is the meaning why we live, okay? And I'm going to kind of explain this. All right, so we see all the beauty around us. And again, like I said at the beginning, nobody can deny it. When you see these pictures, you're drawn to it. I mean, you'd have to be crazy not to be because there's beauty, there's order, there's goodness. It's just, it's just universally <laughs> beautiful, right? Uh, and, and, and there's no opposite. There, there's no opposite of a beautiful mountain so much. There's no opposite of a elephant, you know, just like there's an opposite of murder. There's something that it, it lacks. An elephant isn't lacking anything. An elephant is beautiful. A snake is beautiful. Okay, a hippopotamus is beautiful. All right, so keep all this in mind as we go on and talk about the next question, whether goodness has the aspect of a final cause. Remember, that means meaning, purpose. Since goodness is that which all things desire, and since this has the aspect of an end, it is clear that goodness implies the aspect of an end. Nevertheless, the idea of goodness presupposes the idea of an efficient cause, okay? What brought it into existence in the first place? And also a formal cause, the purpose, the meaning. For we see that what is first in causing is last in the thing caused. Fire, for example, heats first of all before it reproduces the form of fire, though the heat in the fire follows from its substantial form. Now in causing goodness and the end come first. That's very key. Both of which move the agent to act. Secondly, the action of the agent moving to the form. Thirdly, comes the form. Okay, so we are moved to attraction of the good because the goodness exists first. Okay, it's the final cause. It's what's dry. It's what's, what's guiding us to the goodness in itself in the first place. And that goodness is God himself. Okay, so we see all these good things in, um, okay, this is one other thing real quickly, okay, whether God is good. This is the last slide. To be good belongs preeminently to God, for a thing is good according to its desirableness. Now, everything seeks after its own perfection, and the perfection and form of an effect consist in a certain likeness to the agent, since every agent makes its like, and hence the agent itself is desirable and has the nature of good. For the very thing which is desirable in it is the participation of its likeness. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Therefore, since God is the first effective cause of all things, the mountains, the sea, the animals, the sunrise, right? It is manifest that the aspect of good 
and of desirableness belong to him. And hence Dionysius attributes good to God as to the first efficient cause, saying that God is called good as by whom all things subsist. Okay, so we see goodness everywhere we look, in babies, in dogs, in athletics, in precision, in flowers, and all these things that I've shown in this video, okay? We're drawn to them, but we know they're not an end to themselves. We know they came from something, okay? We're not drawn to them because they're evil. We're drawn to them because they're good. And that means something is presupposed, and that is the good uh, being who created them in the first place, who ultimately we really are attracted to in the first place, and therefore it would be impossible for us to be attracted to an evil God who creates what? Creates nothing? Something exists and it's good and it can't be created by an evil God. I hope that convinces you uh, that the evil God challenge is pretty much untenable and that we, we can be convinced and certain that God is good. Thanks for watching. God bless you.